Yeah, welcome uh, everyone in listener land. If you're watching, great. If you're listening, hope your commute or bicycle ride or your exercise mm -hmm. is doing good. My name is Conrad Anker, and I'm from Montana. I'm a mountain climber. And today is the 26th of September, 2003. And you'll be listening to this after the fact, but today is the one-year anniversary of Hillary Nelson and her, Hillary Janet Nelson and her passing on Manaslu last year on this day. So we'll um, recognize you, Hillary, and we also, all of our other friends and family that have been lost to the mountains. But um, yeah, Hills, you're a wonderful person and we love you and this is our way of saying hello and sharing your goodness. So, but in a circular way, I'm uh, here with the podcast, and I'm going to introduce uh, me, Miguel Jinsherva, from uh, Rowaling, and uh, Pasang Tendi from Karakola. Hello, uh, this is me, Pasang Tendi Sherpa. I'm a mountain guide and instructor from Nepal, and I'm a Himalayan athlete, and I'm 35 years old now, and I'm actively guiding on 8,000 meters mountain, and uh, thank you, and so... This is Ming Mazi. Hello, I'm Ming Mazi, born and raised at the altitude of 4,200 meters in Rollwalling Valley. And I've been climbing since 2006. And so far, I've climbed uh, 13 of the 14,000 meter peaks, including the winter, uh, first winter K2 ascent. And today, very happy to be a part of Himali podcast and sharing the frame with a uh, legendary climber, Karnad Dai. Thank you, Dai. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so yeah. it's great being here with everyone. Thank you. Yeah. So yes, both yeah. these uh, gentlemen are just coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, Ming Ma Ji. Well, um, so, I mean, you look totally normal and fine, but like <laughs> 48 hours ago, you were on the summit of Manaslu. Yeah, right. I was, I was on the summit on 22nd September at 9 a.m. in the morning. And this was, this was my like uh, sixth time on Manaslu, but... My second time on Monoslu Main Summit. So in 2021, we uh, opened a new route on Monoslu, what we call like a roll walling dry version. Yep. And I was using auction that time. Since I was doing like all, I'm doing all 14 pick without auctions. So as part of that, I went back on Monoslu this year to complete it without auctions. Nice. Yeah. So I, I, I just flew back. From base camp to um, Kathmandu, and you see my lips is still all wounded. Yeah, <laughs> winded and yeah, it's all frozen actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, mm. you're um, you look incredibly strong. So mm. um, yeah, it kind of it's interesting because it was in 2021 that the Rowaling variation to the summit of Manaslu, because everyone kind of went and they're like, well, it looks too difficult to go up to the top, and right. now you have to go to the summit. So, I mean, it's a route if you go to like some high point and then lower off, but if right. you go to the summit, then that's a peak. And so, um, yeah, it's uh, good that you were working on that uh, in 2021 and that you came back this year and finished it up. Yeah, so right. after we have our uh, fine conversation here, you're taking off again. Yeah. And up to uh, Shisha Pangma. So I just remain Shisha Pangma, but I'll, I'll be leading a team on Choyu as well. Oh, okay. So I'm leaving to Tibet tomorrow. I'll fly to the bo uh, borderline between t uh, China and Nepal. Then from there, we're going to drive all the way to base camp. And hopefully, we're going to finish uh, Choyu by this week. And by next week, we're going to finish Shishabama as well. Because all my team, they are acclimatized, well acclimatized, and they're ready to push summit only. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So let's see. That's pretty good. And um, with us, Pasang Tendi from uh, Karakola. And were were you just on the mountains too, or uh, October six? I will. Uh, I'm planning to go Labuja Peak first, then November first. I will go uh, Tulu Forest Peak, then uh, second week of uh, November. I will go Kajuri Peak. That's oh, my nice. plan. Yeah. Yeah. So Pasang Tendi is a. Um, instructor and a longtime participant of the Kumbu Climbing Center. And um, these are mountains that are in there. And it's, um, it's something that is close to my heart that I, I always appreciate what the Kumbu Climbing Center does. And to see graduates out there 
um, helping other people achieve their goals and being in the mountains and, and things like that. So to fill in a little backstory here, the Kumbu Climbing Center is now coming up on 20 years of anniversary. And um, it was a, an idea with uh, my wife, Jennifer Lowe Anchor, and Panuru, and a couple others. It was mostly from 1999 when I worked on the um, Mallory and Irvine expedition to the north side of Everest. And wow. so that team was from Fort Say. And uh, Jenny and I were trekking 2002, and we were, um, after... Each day of trekking, we'd go climbing, and, and then all the whole, by the time, like everyone wanted to hike fast, and then everyone wanted to go climbing afterwards. So, the, from the cooks to to our um, our lead Sherpa guide, and yeah. and, and the uh, the porters came along with it. So it was a there's um it's kind of if you enjoy climbing and you love climbing, you will be a safer climber. And there's this shift now that I see with both of you. Um, Mingmaji, you're 37, Pasantendi, you're 35, and now you're probably two, three generations into working in the mountains, and that rather than being just about work and a paycheck and mm -hmm. doing what other people are doing, that you're climbing because you love to climb, and in Mingmaji, your case here, looking to climb the 14 peaks without supplemental oxygen, really focusing in on a goal with that. And um, so as a question to you, the do, are there more Sherpa and more Nepali that want to climb because it's fun and they want to go out on their own, or is it still mostly work and profession based? Like uh, previously, it was like only for professions, only for like earning money, but now it's a bit changing, you know, because <clears throat> now Sherpa, like the new generation of Sherpa, they are understanding this thing. Like people get name and both name, fame, money, everything after, once you get, uh, like, uh, once you do something extra, yeah. ordinary things, or uh, once you make, like, some extra climbing, like, um, what you say, like, solo climbing or something, climbing new, new routes, yeah, like, alpine climbing, yeah. if, if they, they do, it like, something big, <coughs> they get both name, fame, and <coughs> later on, they get the chance to earn money, right? So now, this new generation of Sherpa, they're understanding these things, so now they prefer guiding for guiding for earning, but they also do this kind of activities to make themselves like uh, in the in the pub in the media, so they get they can earn some extra for their livelihood, right? And now the younger generations of uh, climbers from the Sherpa community, they want to get like uh, retire early early in in the early age, like we have some climbers like. Let's let's take a, 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 a example of uh, Kamirita who has done it 28 times. We have Pada Sherpa who has done like 27 times. They have been like working only for the money when when they started, right? And <coughs> they still are, they still are working. Now they they saw the name and fame. Yep. <coughs> they are working continually, but like uh, like for our generations, we just okay. So we have certain time only. So okay, I'm gonna work in this field for like ten years, fifteen years. Then I, I'm gonna retire. But within these ten years, I'm gonna do these things. Within these fifteen years, I'm gonna do these these things. We have to, that kind of planning. Yeah. But the old, older generation one, they just they just to work only for the money. So it's like big change now. Yeah, it's a fundamental change within that. So. Both of you are IFMGA mountain guides, which is the highest standard there is for mountain guiding. And they're now in Nepal, there's 73 mountain guides that are IFMGA uh, certified. So share with us what the process, how long it took uh, you to do that, and what the classes are like, and how the instruction is here in Nepal. Uh, as a mountain guide, to be a mountain guide in Nepal now, uh, there's a, if somebody want to be a mountain guide, the process is not uh, hard because many years ago back it's really hard to do to be a mountain guide because to be a mountain guide we have to take a course from Europe but the moment the all the courses organized by Nepal Mountain Guide Association and the Nepal Mountain Guide Instructor Association that's wonderful because even if it is expensive mm. in Nepal it would be more expensive in Europe you have to live over there 
and then there's the language hurdle. So here the the classes are being taught in Nepali, the testing is done in Nepali, so it's really good. And it's um, congratulations to all of the all of you that have worked on that and <coughs> elevating the um, the professionalism of guiding um, along those lines. So. Ming Maji, on to you here. Your goal is to climb the 14 peaks without supplemental oxygen. Yeah, so that's true. <laughs> where are we at with it? Uh, actually, look, <clears throat> I used to climb all the peaks uh, without oxygen when I started. When I started uh, my career in 2006, at the time, like, uh, oxygen were taken like very expensive thing, you know? Yeah. I'm still young, but like I started in 2006, and we were given the job to take all all the equipment auction, auction for the clients, like on the north face of the Everest. So the last game is at 8,300 meters, yep. right? So we used to carry like seven, eight bottles. I have carried like 10 bottles at at the time. So that was all the way to 8,300 meters without auctions. So from there, uh, I got myself like kind of in inspirations. <laughs> and like most of the 8,000 meter peaks, they are lower like 8,200 yeah. meters, right? So the sixth size mountain is uh, Choyu, which is like 8,201. Yep. And there is some, and I used to carry like 10 bottle auctions without uh, without uh, like uh, having auction for myself. I used to carry carry ten bottles, and I used to drop the auction ten bottle auction at uh, eight thousand three hundred meters on Everest. So from there, I I felt like the rest of the eight thousand are easier for me to climb without. Yeah. Then yeah, <laughs> then my yeah my on my first summit on Everest, I just used only one bottle. Then I had like many other eight thousand meter peaks, which are all without auctions. Then. Later on, like uh, when I started, <coughs> when I started, it, it was kind of like interest for me because my grandfather, he was used to work as a porter and he used to take the tourists over the Tassel Vaza Pass. There's like a, a valley. There's like a pass between go, Rawaling going, yeah, going from Rawaling to Kumbu, Kumbu Valley. And my uh, grandfather used to work as a porter, you know. Yep. And my father did the same. And later on, my father got the opportunity to work as a local guide to the tourists and used to climb as a as a porter and as a as a like local guide on like 6000 7000 meter peaks with the tourists then like this to talk lots of thing like every 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 day we had a conversation at home like uh, different stories from different mountain so i had always like kind of like interest to join at least one exp expeditions then i went to manasulu with my uncle in 2006, I finished my school. Then I had like three month, three months holiday, and I had nothing to nothing to do. And it was like um, springtime, you know, like spring season just started, and there was huge demand of Sherpas, you know. And my uncles like <coughs> he had a big team on Manaslu, and it was not necessary for him to have like good training, good trained uh, guides, because it was it was it was a, a cleaning expedition expeditions so we we just had to go and clean the rubbish only yeah and fortunately like i was like physically very strong and i learned some good techniques from uh, some of my colleagues on the exped expeditions and i was able to reach like uh, 6400 meters and then from there i i started developing little interest in expeditions then after that i continued climbing then gradually i made this as professions and when i made my professions when when i made this as my professions i saw like mm, there are no any nepalese we have done like 14 big without auctions then i started okay making planning i started planning for myself yep. i didn't have any godfather in this field so <coughs> i had to start everything for myself like Climbing in Nepal was still okay. Like climbing in Tibet and climbing in <coughs> Pakistan was a big task for us. Yeah. So in 2013, when I finished Kanchanjunga, uh, I did it without auctions. Then I had a uh, client from Iran called like Mr. Reza Sahili. So he was interested in going K2, you know. And I said like, okay, I'll go with with you on K2 and. I'll I'll work free for you. Yeah, that that, that was that's what what I told. But your he, trade off. Yeah, yeah, because I I really needed to go to K two that at the time because K two was like taken so big name at the time. Yep. 
So I just... What year was that? It was in 2014. That, that was 14. the year when uh, three Nepalese women climbed, oh, yeah. climbed K2. That oh, yeah. was the yeah, first, time, first time from Nepal that uh, Nepalese women climbed K2. Yeah, Maya Pasanglam. Yeah, Maya Pasanglam and Dayong Jim, right. Yeah. So <clears throat> here for money. Actually, and then after that, I got like two other interested clients and uh, I started organizing myself as well. <laughs> so I had like three clients and I was like doing every, everything for them. Like they had like uh, three three bottle of auction each, like nine bottle of auctions, and I was like uh, climbing without. So I carried like nine <coughs> nine bottle of auction to camp last camp, like camp four, with tin with food. I was the only one in the team getting everything. And on a summer day, I was like without auctions, and I was still carrying like six bottle of auction for my three clients. So there was a uh, client from Iran, Mr. Mr. Reza. There was a client from Turkey, uh, Adin. There was a client from Macedonia, Mr. Dropko. And they were like having three bottles each. And uh, they were having one bottle in the inner back and the rest two bottles I was carrying for them. So it was like six bottles in my back and I was uh, climbing without auctions. Did they give you a good tip? Yeah, it was, it, <laughs> I think the some the That's a lot of work yeah, for anyone was out more there. important for me that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too. But what how much? What does one uh, bottle of oxygen weigh? It's almost like three and a half kg. Yeah. So yeah, for that's thirty five kg plus your pack. So you're yeah. probably around forty kg to get ten bottles up there. So that's a, a huge load. Yeah, so, it does. It does huge. Yeah. One thing was that I I, I need to. Finish K2 without auctions, and I also need to climb K2. Yeah, it's for my own like yeah. own my career as well, yeah. right? That was a good move. Yeah, yeah. That, that was that was that was the, the uh, exhibition that changed my life actually. Wow. And after that, I started uh, organizing continuously in Pakistan. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, that's a wonderful. Yeah, and here we are. So uh, fingers crossed. Um, I mean, I think by the time this podcast lands, we'll know whether you made the summits, but. Um, Here's to that, and here's to our uh, our, our friend and, and your family, uh, Dawa yeah. Youngsum, who, if she finishes uh, Cho Yu, and she's upon which she was the first Nepali woman to climb the 14 peaks. So right. And that, um, yeah, <laughs> that's good to see um, all of that, that connection in there with that. So a couple, um, to pivot over to Mount Everest, um, mm -hmm. were you both working on the mountain last year on, on Everest? Yeah, I was, I was there. Yeah, and so it was the highest amount of fatalities in a year. That's I true. think they had sold the most amount of permits. Right. And a lot of people there, a new level of luxury. Right. Um, and this is uh, Himalayan fixed rope climbing on the 14 peaks, and it's uh, its own branch of climbing experience. And to accept it as that. And if you don't want right. to climb those, don't go on those routes. But they're there, and... There's a service that's provided by the Nepali Sherpa climbers that make it easy or make it less effort for people without mountain experience to get up on the mountains. Um, but do you think that the the 400 plus permits they sold is that do they need to sell more? Do they need to sell yes less, or is that right at the um, it was it a, a good amount of, of permits to be issuing for the mountain? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing for like uh, Nepalese people because we get more job. It's good for our government because they get like more money from the permits, right? But yeah, on the, on the mountain, it's not not that good because we have like more people means like more rubbish, more, uh, more damages, yeah. right? But for the country and for the economy of the country, it's, it's good. Yeah, it's a flywheel for the rest of the economy. Right. I mean, mm. Everest affects trekking business and everything with that. Right. And so, yeah, there's still... The beautiful thing about Everest is there is only one Everest, so... Yeah, this is the highest one, so people are attracted, right? Yeah, so, yeah. they're going to... And it's... um, But there's... When I started climbing, the mountain was like, did you have the skills to get up there? And that would sort of choose if you were an expert or not. And then now it's in a... A monetary sense so if you pay the money you have the permit or the permit could be a lottery which is random just anyone gets it or some combination of all three of those might um, work out on that but it would be neat to see the people that want to climb Everest that they do two expeditions in Nepal 
before they go on Everest. So um, the tourism department was a little bit worried that it would close up the business. But because it's Everest, my own view is that the people would still come. And then if they had to spend two times in Nepal before they went there, they would be better trained. They'd be a safer mountain with that. But it would also increase the amount of employment for people in Nepal. Right. That's true, yeah. When the, when there are like more people, we uh, we get more job. It's not only like the only not only the Sherpa guides, but when the tourists land at the airport, the taxi driver, after the, the hotel from there, the oh, air, yeah. airlines from there, the porters, and the what uh, and the lodges on the way, and all the all the all the public on the, on the way, they get they get job, they get money. Yeah, it's a good thing. But yeah. I think there should be like certain rules on Everest. There shouldn't be that much that much permits. It's okay to give much more permits, but uh, we should have like some kind of system where we can control the death, where we can control the rubbish, where we can control all the human waste, right? Yep. I think there should be like certain rules which we are lacking still. Yeah, the foundation of that might be a carrying capacity study. So yeah, right. on Denali, which is the high point of North America, 6,201 meters, they limit it to 1,400 climbers in one season. The season goes from April to July, and it's 6,000 meters, but you have to carry everything yourself. And But they have a limit on that. And if there was a carrying capacity study that was done by either Truvon University or Kathmandu University to understand the impact of the climbers, um, how much they use helicopters, human waste, right. the safety aspect of it that um, they're... But one of the the beautiful things that being here in Nepal and seeing that the guiding business on the big peaks is owned and run by Nepalis. And, and 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Right. It was guys like myself that would show up and we'd work yeah. for a company and... and but now it's far more equitable, and Nepali companies are taking the lead on that. And from my own standpoint, it happened quicker than I in anticipated. I didn't think it was going to move that quickly. And um, it's a reflection of um, of all of you as mountain guides and people wanting to come out there and and uh, and learn to climb with you. Yeah, everything. Everything. What we are doing now, we learn everything from like. The Western companies like Russell Bryce, IMG, yep. uh, Consultant, we learn everything from them. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now we are, we are actually kind of doing kind of competitions. We are competing with them in giving like better service. Yeah. And yeah, personally, like I run a company called Imagine Nepal, uh, and I have a limit on on my expectations. It's not like uh, some of the companies who, who who take as much as client they get. But I have a limit, and then I have my like uh, I do I don't do any press competitions, which lots of uh, our Nepalese company are doing now, and that's the reason the increased number of climbers on on mountain and more fatality uh, like more yep. deaths. So oh uh, yeah, unfortunately I had a uh, th uh, three Sherpa died on Everest this year while um, fixing the rope because. It was it was like it was I would say it was like more natural because they they were just crushing in the Kumbu ice ball and the big block of ice just fell down and collapsed yep. on them, so they they died over there. But this, like, yeah. more Nepalis and Sherpa climbing die in the ice fall than they do on summit day. Right. And the summit day is is the is are the are the the visitors the people that buy a permit and they're like oh I'm gonna make it to the summit and then. The battery runs out and they and they perish. But in but yeah, exposure and time that in the ice fall and that's right. It's a that yeah it must have been really difficult for you with three people. That's yeah. that's yeah that's very that was very difficult for me. Yeah, they're they're um yeah rest in. Uh, but that was um to circle back to um, imagine Nepal. So mm. if anyone out here listening wants to go climbing with either Basang or Ming Maji, that, yeah. Um, yeah, you can come visit Nepal. And, you know, our conversation was that when you're here and you're climbing, it's a great way to bring 
something to the local economy. Right. And so, yeah, we understand there's a, a lot of money is in the Western and not just Western Europe and North America, but also in Singapore and Beijing. And that when that money comes here and they, people spend it to go climbing, that money doesn't leave the country. So it's always um, that the multiplier effect and that Everest is unique. There is only one Everest that is, it is Nepal's greatest resource right. um, because there is no oil in the ground here. <laughs> yeah. It's so mountainous, you can't travel easily. And yeah. part of the reason why Nepal was never a colony because you can't come here. And But that's the strength and it's reflected right. in the people there. So, But yeah, if you're out here listening and um, yeah, imagine Nepal, I'm going to get you up there at an 8,000 meter peak. Yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it is, yeah, there's you, you, from my standpoint as a climber, you haven't lived life until you've seen sunrise above 8,000 meters, but right. <laughs> that's not for everyone on there. So I climbed Everest for the first time, May 17th, 1999, from north side. Oh, sorry, right. And there wasn't fixed rope, there wasn't, the ladder was there on the second step, but it was kind of a, a wild experience. Came back 2007, also climbed it from the north side. And then 2012, climbed it Nepali side, south side. Mm -hmm. And But 2012 was a really difficult year because we had a short window. There was four oh, okay. days of good climbing weather within that. And when you have that, um, two years ago, there was two weeks of good weather on Everest. And the jet stream didn't come down and the winds weren't blowing and people were able to, to have a good summit on that. But the, um, the, there's more to Everest than what people see, the, the, the piles of rubbish and the oxygen cylinders and the, the crowding on that. And in a sense that figuring out how many people can go up on a summit day, um, eventually, I mean, they're, to go from the South Pole to the summit, you could put so many people on there, it would be like the traffic jam here in Tamal sometimes when it just it stops and you have to like work through it. And those traffic jams are happening up there. And so from your standpoint, what would you suggest to the guide companies, the government of Nepal, the clients, the guides? What would, how would you make that a, that, what would you do to work out a better solution to the overcrowding? Uh, in, in the average from my side, so when we issue the permit from Nepal government, and I, I really love to say and suggest to the government, please give the number, suppose to this 2024, it will be start from the one, give the one, two, three, give the number, and just uh, they make a first window, suppose to give the client permit number, like uh, suppose to one, two, the 30 number of the permit they can add him a first window oh, okay and then after 30 to 60 they can add him a second window and uh, we can divide the when we issue the permit because when we issue the permit they take a loss of the 500 400 to 500 permit issue in a year it's a big mess on the mountain and for this is a professionally is if the Nepal government want to organizing is the permit number wise because all the staffs and all the uh, logistics are managed by systematically a by a day by day mm -hmm. and it uh, because of that way only one that way we can uh, solution supposed to we can uh, uh, increase the numbers uh, let's say is uh, 30 is just the example but it's gonna be divided uh, some windows like other than that is uh, there is uh, some windows and uh, some is really difficult to organize uh, of course it is 8000 meter but it is a uh, possible yeah well it's that's there. a good idea so the yeah. the first 60 people if you pay for your permit 2 years in advance you yeah. have first win weather window window of, yeah. of course yes because they sell them all the way up until April or May and so yeah yeah, that's true. Yeah, because uh, other than that, because when the people in the best camp is the uh, everybody wants to add him a first or second window, right? And for this, if we from the government level, if we can bring a one very advanced systems yeah. to minimize for this, 
of course it works and all the people all the client keep the mind that uh, systems then after even for the company and for the guide also to make a decision is a very easy way other than that as a guide in my experience that group did a summit last week and why we are behind that group are this why we are is so many questions come on as a guide to, if uh, our government make a rules in that way and because all the questions are giving the answer by rules is more easy as a guiding that's a good insight onto that yeah. Yeah. Uh, my suggestion to our nepalese government wa- <coughs> government was that like okay if if somebody is cl- coming for everest okay he's coming next year for everest let him come at least one eight thousand meter peaks this year yep that will help uh, the climber to know the environment of eight thousand meter get more trainings yep. right and No, well, and ev- and Everest, yeah. like yeah, every everyone feel like Everest is easy, you know, yeah. because Everest is easy, and this is the tallest one, and every everyone is attracted because Everest is the only one which is the tallest one, right? So everyone is attracted to that. But for climbing Everest, if you have some like good experience, like above six thousand meter peaks, then seven thousand, then eight thousand, then you get well trained, you know. Yeah. Then like on the summit day or or rest of the day. When you are uh, going on Everest, you can go easily and you can come down easily because yeah. you are well trained already. But what we see at the uh, what we see on the mountain at the moment, there are lots of people who even don't know how to use the blade device, yeah. how to use the zoomer. You know, yeah. that's making the traffic yeah. actually. And yeah, they're they, the ones yeah. and they get into trouble. Yeah, they they are the one who who makes the trouble to yeah. other. Yeah, yeah. Mm. and th- there are lots of people who are. Very slow, and we we cannot we cannot do this this these things, and they get stuck there, yep. and the rest of the people behind him or front of uh, above him get stuck because yep. because of that that, and lots of people get out of auctions, run ran out of yep. auctions, and many death happen because of that, yeah. you know, so we had like a few suggestions to our Nepalese Nepalese government, but it's not taken seriously. So yeah, there there yeah. should be. A few more. My own You're personal right. story. I started climbing when I was 14, and I went to Mount Rainier. Then I went to Alaska. Then I, I climbed in the Himalayas for 11 years with 6,000 meter peaks, 7,000 meter peaks. Before I went to Everest for the first time, and I, it was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I have right. to like climb more and more. And now we have people that it's their first climb. They're, they're. They're going to go out there. And they're going to go climb these peaks, yeah. and and in that sense, that yeah, the Nepal government's like you need to climb a peak, not Amada Blom, because yeah. everyone's there and yeah. move them away. But go climb another peak in the Rawalpindi and climb to six, seven thousand meters and learn to work with the Nepali people. Understand how Sherpas work on the mountain. Learn to That's appreciate yeah. Dalbot. <laughs> <I'm laughs> yeah. sure, and then yeah. become part of these. They people come in and they they get the summit and then. They just take. They're like, I'm the hero, and I put my. This is my. I I made it to the top, and now I'm gonna go home with that prize. But they yeah. need to give something back, and because they're taking the, the essence of what Nepal is, the mountains and Mount Everest, and they're taking it um, out with them. It's um. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty difficult to deal with these things. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There there was one picture taken. I'm not sure. Um, It was picture from 2019 or 12. I'm not yeah. sure. There was a guy who had a helmet on the opposite directions, Ugh. and with with the harness, it was it was on op- opposite directions, and he had like yeah. a quick draw on that. Uh-huh. I'm not sure wh- why quick draw is needed yeah. for Everest for him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To- yeah. Yeah. These are. Uh, yeah. We should. Uh, they make memes out of those things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so they're. Yeah. But that's an example of it. And yeah, when I was there in 2012. Um, There was a Nepali Canadian woman, and I saw her coming out of the top by Camp One, coming up and late in the day, and just. I met I met her there in Hilary Step. Yeah. And you know we don't have that big in 2012, big rock we were now. There. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, it was there. It was still there. Yeah. Yes, she was trying to climb that. She, I think she fell four times, and mm-hmm. at the end her shepherd drag drag her up on the rock. 
but she was like climbing up pl- falling down climbing up falling down climbing up falling uh, down yeah. if if it she had like good, tr- good training and if she had like yeah. um, good experience from out the 7000 meter peaks i think she could have survived she could have easily climbed climbed that big rock yeah i think she she lost lots of her energy there oh she i met her in the ice wall yeah. and i i, I was she wasn't wearing gloves. She didn't have sunglasses on. It was late oh. in the day. And the poor Sherpa that was working with her was just, he was like, I don't want to be here because it was just incredibly slow. And so I asked her, how long have you been in the ice fall? And, and, and I was like, yeah, if you can't move through the ice fall in four hours or six hours, what's, I, I forget the times on ice fall mm-hmm. going, but she was double the ice fall <clears throat> going time. And it was, um, yeah, and then because we were both on the mountain that year, mm, yeah. and she passed away a day or two before I did. And it was, um, yeah, using nine cylinders of nine bottles of oxygen and putting a lot of people at risk. And right. she, it was her first expedition, so she learned how to use crampons there. And yeah. It, um, and we, you know, the mountains are a free place. We can go do any climb you want, but when you have easy access with fixed rope, Sherpa support, yeah. staff, oxygen like that, you can get into trouble really easy. If you go climb Gayon Chengkang, just next door is 7,900 meters, and no one goes there. Right. There's no fixed rope. You're right. going to be climbing. Right. And you, you're going to figure out, the mountain will tell you what you can climb, but on Everest, the people get up, and now all of a sudden they're above balcony, and they give up, and so then they're a liability. And so the video that came out from last year with... Um, they were carrying, carrying. yeah, I mean, just <laughs> you know, people, yeah. they send these to me. They're like, is this real? And I'm like, yeah, this is real. This, this is, this yeah, is, yeah. and it's Nepali Sherpa people that are working, mm. working on these jobs. Has the overall skill level of people working on the mountain, has it increased and are they up to date with current equipment? Is there equality between Western and visiting climbers and the people that work on the mountain. Yes, it's lots changed now. No, when I started, I had nothing. No training, nothing. And actually, I was stuck on Loche South Face, where I, st- I started feeling that I should have some training. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty big climb, yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> so mm. then, since two thousand ten, I, s- I started tra- uh, taking training from like. I started with uh, uh, Nepal Modern Associations. Then after that, I had the hunger of being the IFF, IFMJ guide. And then in, in 2012, I started uh, taking training for uh, like courses for courses to be prepared for the IFMJ entrance. So in 2012, I finally. Um, Got the in, got the entrance level cap uh, capability. Yep. Because uh, they are they are like a uh, two different way to enter IFMJ guides in Nepal. So one is through the training, and another is uh, through the background of the yep. expeditions. So I int- I enter uh, with the background of the expe- expeditions. Yep. So I had like five eight thousand meter peaks, seven thousand meter peaks, six thousand meter peaks. So I entered 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 with from there. But I still I had some training, but I was like. I didn't knew almost like everything. I didn't. I didn't knew. I didn't knew anything at yeah. all. When I was in the training, um, my team members they were like uh, we were like five from five five, five from the exhibition uh, category and five from the training. And the, the, those who came from the training, they knew everything like with with the, with the rope techniques, yep. rescue techniques, medicines, first aid. Like we we were like just looking at at them and staring at them. We had we had, okay we we were like carrying carrying lot. We used to, uh, we, we had the uh, knowledge of like, okay, putting uh, putting the snow bars, okay, uh, using the ice screw, but no, not a proper rope, yeah. uh, not a proper knot on, yeah. on those things. And we realized that those were like very risky mm-hmm. when, I, when, when we, did, we did that. Then I finished my aspirant guide course and I had, I had like, I felt like I had enough knowledge to go for like any like uh, alpine climbing then after that i did like some really good climbing like uh I, i'm i'm not sure if you know bamungo that's just above the na mm-hmm. one of the best climbing 
it's, we did all alpine all the way to summit and i did a uh, tobuji uh this that's just in front of the now above the lake yeah it's very sharp warm and nobody did uh nobody made a climb uh, on that face so i did i did that on on my own on solo, solo yeah. yeah that's good so yeah then <coughs> I, s- I still tell my my all my colleagues all my staffs uh, you need you need to have training and now my all my staff they're they're taking taking training and uh, I, I've been organizing like w- winter ice climbing course rock uh, rock climbing course for my staffs and now now they are trained and they feel like most of my staff they are like of forty five years fifty years and they said like we are learning now yeah what we did we did. And we are like we were lucky. We we are still alive. And now now the training level is like increasing a lot. And now every individual who are coming in this field, they are taking training. Yeah. And I see like uh, from uh, Kumbu area, KCC has KCC has uh, big contributions. All the guys from Kumbu area, they have like a, a good level of ice, cli- ice climbing tra- uh, yeah. training, and. Uh, I see. I see. Like uh, last last time I, I was on K two, I saw like I saw um, the old. <coughs> they are they are not old. Like uh, I, I forgot the guy from Porte. They were, I thought like <coughs> they were of old generation, but they said like uh, we took training from KCC. Oh yeah. And I felt like wow, you got because they move like they made a route under the ice. It was like so amazing routes on K two, and we we're climbing from the second routes. So I said, oh, I thought like, not bad. Yeah, there we no? go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was really good. And now we have like a KCC, NNMGA, and um, NNIA. So this, uh, these are some of the like, organizations which are giving lots of training to the climbers in Nepal. And now we, we have kind of like competitions in the market. Who problems better? Like I'm from Royal Walling area. And he's from like Karikola, yeah. so we have competition kind kind of competition between us, like who <laughs> makes better way, yeah. yeah, who has like more techniques on the yeah. mountain. Yeah, uh, there you go, you moving know? moving it up. Yeah. So, what would you think if every expedition at Everest Base Camp had to have one UAGM guide, one IFMGA guide that was part of that team? We, we still don't have that system. Yeah. But if it, but you don't have, yeah, there's 73 guides, but if there was 40 expeditions, there could be, I mean, one IFMGA guide for the team will make everyone else safer. And then it would, more climbers would want, they say, if I want to get ahead, I'm going to become an IFMGA guide like the two of you are. So. Yeah, there are lots of Sherpa who wants to be IFMGA guides. And um, we have lots of clients who prefer to have uh, IFMGA guide as their guide. But uh, unfortunately, we just have like uh, I think almost eighty at the moment, and that's not enough because we have yeah. lots of mountain. Yeah. It's not only Everest. We have like eight of the fourteen peaks in Nepal, and n- not o- not only that, we have seven thousand meter peaks, six thousand yeah. meter peaks, and most of our FMZ guides in Nepal now, the younger generation one. They don't prefer going K- uh, Everest. They prefer going like six thousand meter peaks. Yep. There they get more money because it's it's like one week or four days or three days. Yeah. And they get paid well, and they get more job there. Everest is it's, it's gonna take like forty five days. Yep. And instead you have of to Everest, go the they ice can ball. they can do yeah. like a, a ten six thousand meter yeah. peaks, and yeah. they are uh, double up Everest. Yeah. You know? There we go. Yeah. It's a transition. So. so. The younger generation of FMZ guys in Nepal, they prefer going 6,000 meter yep. peaks and like uh, those peaks where they get like more money than Everest. Because Everest, Everest, you need to carry everything, you know. You need to carry for your clients, you need to carry yep. for yourself. And it's too much physical work. Yep. On 6,000 meter peaks, you don't need to. You just carry with a light backpack and the ni- now the guides, they just, w- the young guys, they just want to be like handsome, you know. <laughs> Tip top, yeah. uh, in front of the clients, in yeah. front of like good girls, and, and <laughs> yeah, like, you know, so well, it's different. Question for you, Ming Machi: Is climbing Everest without supplemental oxygen? How different is that from then using the regular oxygen? Um, <clears throat> I did only once without oxygen on Everest. That was in two thousand twenty-one. 
I did total number of like six six summits on Everest, and my first was in two thousand seven. I was I didn't have any knowledge of about auctions at that time, like how to use auctions, how to fit the foot the regulators, how to at what uh, pressure you, what bar you should take auction at what level. I I was not known that. I was just given a client. I just took the clients and we went to summits. I had a French French guy as 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 my clients, Mr. Bruno. I still remember his name, and we had auction from Cam Three from eight thousand twenty meters, and we had a Sherpa a Sherpa leader in the in the team, and at like eight thousand five hundred meters around that, uh, our auction we, they they helped us change change the auction bottle, and later on that, I didn't have any knowledge. The rest of the team they got back without summits. Because it was cold nights, and my team, my member, and I continued because that was my first summit chance. I could grab it, and that was the first summit chance for my French guy because it 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 was a um, uh, group program, not not individual. So he wanted to make summits. I wanted to make summits, but we both didn't have knowledge about auctions. So we went all the way to the summit. We didn't know what what time we finished the auctions. You know. On the way down, we came. <coughs> we came all the way to uh, Camp Three. Till we re- reached Camp Three, we didn't know. Then, when we reached Camp Three, then there were like other Sherpa waiting for us, and they said like, "Both of your auction are empty. You you didn't have, you didn't have any auctions." <laughs> My first experience on auctions, you know. Then, I started getting good, little bit like experience from like uh, using auction from two thousand nine only. On Everest again from the south side, then I realized that using oxygen is a bit compared to the body. You can walk uh, easier. There is not not like a kind of like pain on your knee. You can step easier in 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 an easy way. You can do most of the activities easily. But when you when you are without oxygen, it's it's a bit difficult. Uh, but I don't know. Maybe it's, it's because of my gene, or maybe I, I was like climbing most of the eight thousand meter peak without oxygen, so I didn't I didn't have that much feeling. But every year on on Everest, I used to, I took one one bottle because it was necessary uh, for me because I was guiding. Yep. I was not climbing myself. Making it safer. Yeah. So it was it was um, for my client, not for myself. And in two thousand twenty one, I I finally made my mind to climb without auctions. But uh, at that uh, that year, uh, what uh, g- good thing was that I, I was like uh, I was climbing Dalagiri in March, then I was climbing Kanjong in April, and I was climbing uh, Everest in March. So it was like three eight thousand meter peaks in a row. So I I felt like easy to climb Everest with auction, but it's still without and with it with auction is bit big difference, you know. You don't get tired uh, that easily when you are on auction. Yep. When you when you are without auction, you get tired. Your mouth get uh, like um, swollen, and breathing is not easy. You get all the time cold air. When you are on the max, you have more like warm air. Yep. Mm, right. It's a huge difference. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a huge difference. It lowers the elevation. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, and the Sherpas are the one that carry it up there. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're and they're um, that's kind of a. Yeah, it's, it's a big big deal at the, at the moment at, for 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 now. Like the younger generation Sherpa, they are raising in the lower places, and they need auction now for like a, even carrying loads to South Coal, They need auctions. But when we when I started my job, no auction was given to any Sherpa. Yeah, you carry ten bottles to last camp. You carry nine bottles, ten bottles, no auctions. <laughs> you need to yeah. you need to go on your own. But now now we see like. Sherpa getting like four bottle auction or three bottle auction, and one is uh, one yeah. they are using themselves. At the end, they just they just deposit like two, two. or three bottles yeah. at at South Coal, yeah. and this is this is one of the reason lots of companies co- complain that oh we lost auctions at at <laughs> at South Coal or we lost auction at last game. Yeah, the fact thing is that they are hiring the, some of some of the like very poor quality of people who cannot even carry, carry like two bottle auctions to South Coal. Or to the last game, and they they put somewhere on the on the way, and they just go back and tell like, oh, we deposited everything there in the campo, and later when the guides, when the yeah. leader and the 
members go to the go to the camp yeah. to find auctions and they say like oh last type trading last type thing is stole on <laughs> so many things you know that's true that's a different game up there yeah yeah so um Pasang, you've got uh, a business you're launching coming up here, uh, Camp to Summit. Tell us about that. Okay, well, after a long journey of my guiding experience, I started my uh, profession since 2009 as a turning and uh, actively uh, working in the 8,000 meters mountain. Uh, Annapurna 1 is my starting journey. And the uh, Sisapangma, I climbed to 8,000 meters mountains without oxygen. With the... Uh, one of the famous climb, climbers, she's from Spain. Her name is uh, Idorni Pasaban. She's the one of the first women who completed the 48,000 meters in the world. And then after uh, start my training mountaineering career, working and uh, seasonally I work and during the off season I spend my money for the mountaineering career. So I came from this way till to climbing and training, climbing and training. And uh, finally, in 2018, I complete my IFMJ Mountain Guide course. Then after uh, 2018 to till this date, I'm work actively working. And then after I decided to uh, uh, run my camp to company because as of my uh, experience, and uh, there's a loss of the customer are w asking why you are working for others all in your life. Now you have to do something and there's a loss of the feedback. And I decided to open my camp to summit company. Wishing you um, tremendous success on that and everything else with this. So, yeah, it's been wonderful to catch up. And, um, yeah, it's been great to explore the the, the challenges of climbing the Himalayas and the contribution mm -hmm. of the Nepali and the Sherpa climbers to high altitude climbing and on that. Any other ideas or thoughts, wisdom you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, well, so to be a mountaineer or to be a client, to be a guide, <laughs> it's always give the priority and to keep your mind as a safety margin. <coughs> Try to as a client, when you climb in the mountain, always don't depend on your guide. Please be uh, ready yourself from the training, uh, from uh, experience. Then always, when you have uh, enough experience in the mountain, when you have uh, enough confidence in the mountain, then after you enjoy a lot in the mountain. If you are always depending with the uh, Sherpa and uh, you are so struggling on the mountain without uh, like you missing mountain view or there's so many if you are not capable to the mountain you are submitting but you missing so many good things if you are capable and confidence are there you enjoy so many things at the same time yeah and at the end so as a Himalayan athlete so I'm very grateful to be here with the Mingma Ji and uh, with the corner Dai, I'm so happy and thank you so much, Dave Dai and Claire. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good way to uh, to bring us in here. And so, Ming Maji, it's been great to uh, share uh, stories with you from everything from Winter K2 to the Imagine Nepal, your your your, your guiding business. Thank you, Dai. <clears throat> and um, yeah, wishing we'll know. Um, how things go, and you'll probably see Da Youngsum over there. She's now. <laughs> let's yeah. go. Let's go, Biney. <laughs> let's go, Biney. <laughs> Biney yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you so much, and thanks for listening in, and all of you out there. Big uh, thanks to uh, Claire and Dave at Himali mm. for bringing this to our ears, and everyone that's uh, part of this. So, rubber side down for every mile of road there's two miles a ditch and keep it keep yeah. it safe yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you